Two centuries ago, the British Empire planted the seed of a new civilization on the far side of the world, in Australia. Eight months hard sailing from home. Now, four modern day families, one from England, one from Ireland, one from Tasmania, and an Aboriginal clan from the northeast coast of Australia, travel back in time to relive the birth of the Australian colony. For four months, here in this isolated valley, they'll face hardship, history, and each other in the colony of 1800. Previously on the colony, Kerry and Paul have decided to take the best bit of bark. Winging out with a piece of bark. I worry about the health of my community when I've got myself happy. The Australian and Irish families disagree about the importance of community. You don't get a community by three groups of people living separately, doing their own thing, right? But we're not working on a community to start with, are we? Or Adjusting to an unfamiliar diet and a lack of sleep has taken its toll on the children. His lips are really dry. Is your tummy eased off a bit now, has it? No. But things are even tougher in the curry camp. What do we say to these young ones when they can't have any sugar and honey? We can't go and bar it because, it, you know, sometimes they only got enough for themselves. You know, we're taking it out of their mouths. Escaping. Escape convict. Blow the bloody mask. Oh. It's mid-morning, and our group of 21st century settlers are gathering on the riverbank to receive their government stores. They've survived in isolation for 10 days. They're gonna eat now. Lovely, mate. Huh? Beautiful, he said. Let's try one, Anton. Oh. Oh. You don't eat that part. What That's the biggest... white part you don't no, eat. No, the head of it. Anto Donovan shares his haul of worm-like carbro with the white settlers. <laughs> These were a common delicacy for the indigenous people living along the Hawkesbury River. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah. Chewy. Thanks, mate. Just give them a clue. What did it taste You're like? You're what like, though? Like, shit, all right? <laughs> Only John and Liz Stevenson from Yorkshire seem keen on the local grub. Just get it chilled. I'd rather die before I eat it. John. Chew it. I've swallowed that. <laughs> Australian historian Michael McKernan is delivering basic rations measured out for each family, exactly as settlers received in the original colony. He's also bringing Rindy Newman, the first female convict. In 1800, each newly arrived family was given two convict servants, free land, and government stores for a year. I'll introduce Rindy Newman to you. Rindy Hi. is... Uh, a convict assigned to the honkies. Women convicts were rare in the early colony. Men outnumbered women six to one. The stores you'll find this time are a little bit different. Um, this just goes to the ebb and flow of the colonies. If you people have got stuff that you think is tradable, there could be quite an advantage to you if you want something from Sydney. Can we trade convicts? No, you'd lose a convict if you surrendered a convict. Really What's that thing? Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Lamp oil. 200 years ago, river traders were the Hawkesbury settlers' lifeline to civilization. Hello, I'm Michael. I haven't met you. Amongst other things, the traders sought Aboriginal artifacts, which they'd often barter for tobacco or rum. There's a lot of interest in the colony back in London, and there interested in the typical type of, you know, indigenous equipment, artifacts. Artifact. Yeah. I'll take the Woomera, and if you throw in the boomerang, yeah. I'll give you the lot except the tea. 
That's a deal. That's a deal. All right. Okay. It's all yours. You want me? Rindy Newman sprained her ankle only a few days before being assigned to the Australian family. Historically, female convicts were often thought of as prostitutes and may not have been welcomed by the mistress of the house. Now we have Rindy in. I've got the children and I don't want, I don't need her to step in. I don't think that that's the place for her to be doing. That's my load and that is the main workload. Over the first 10 days, the Honky family from Tasmania have restored their abandoned hut. Tracy has four young children to care for. The youngest, Lincoln, is only five. Her male convict, Paul Ward, works on an outdoor kitchen, and the newly arrived Rindy is assigned to the garden. I've just been along the path and raking up all the mulch and you know, getting that done, taking it over to the garden. And whenever my foot starts to feel sore, after about an hour, it gets a bit swollen and a bit sort of achy. Sit down till that goes away and then start again. Meanwhile, the Hurleys from Dublin, with their two able-bodied male convicts, are still camping. By the end of the first week and a half, Trish was keen to get the house going, but it's going to take about two weeks. It's heavy stuff. Every bit of board you have to saw is difficult because the timber is extremely hard and the saws aren't great. Um, so that'll be interesting though. We'll be nice to get into the house then. In the Koori camp, the Aboriginal clan live in traditional bark huts. Watching the white fellas adapting to life on the frontier is always good for a laugh. Yeah, to go, too scared to go to the English camp. I don't want to go wider than there. Because that fellas got diarrhea and they said it's contagious. <laughs> When I was having the diarrhoea problems, this was a bad spot to be. Yeah, because yeah, then he walked yeah. poo all over everyone. He had to wake me up yeah. every time he went out. And he walked diarrhoea everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a good thing. <laughs> it was bad. Despite the diarrhoea of convict Andy, the Stevensons remain quite intimate with their two Australian labourers. And I'm just wrapping everybody up in a big cocoon of calico because it, the temperature drops at night and convict Keo has concocted an unusual bedtime ritual to cope with the spiders. Get your funnel web protection on, kids. Yeah. See, what happens is the baby funnel webs crawl in and you're lying on your side, they see a hole and they think it's their hole. So they climb in it and they start to silk line your ear hole. And that's where they settle down for the night. So, subsequently, everybody has one of these things and you go like this, you see. And that's how we sleep. <laughs> We've got full 100% insect protection. That's it. Good night to the outside world. Finding enough native foods to live on has proved very difficult for the Aboriginal clan. Anto has had to venture far afield in search of bush tucker. Well, when I went for a walk the other day, I went up top of the mountain. When I went up towards the top, I've had a funny feeling that someone was watching me and following me around. This sea mountain is a very sacred mountain. Anto comes from Nambucca Heads, far to the north, and is unfamiliar with the local spirits. He felt their presence while gathering the black wattle gum he uses to bind his spear. Just about ready. I've been having feelings about this area. Um, like if it's a mountain calling me to go back up there. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's good or bad. Or if they want to tell me something, I've been getting urges for a couple of days to just go walk about. And I'd like to get to know more about this part of the country. 
and the way the, the direct people live and to learn their language. Darak, Dark and Jang, Gandangara, Darwo, Nagalo Gore, Malang Boot Boot, Gumaida, Gumaida. Richard Green is one of the few speakers of Darak in the world, the native language of the Sydney region. He's descended from a convict who married an Aboriginal woman from the Darug Nation. How's it going? Good. How's it going? 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 So what do you say when you're coming down? I was saying for the spirits to come and join yeah, us and, said that, and heal and heal and enjoy what's going on here because they're everywhere. They are. <laughs> so how long you go back? I'm born in the Blue Mountains, but yeah. this is all Darug country, yeah. Dark and Jung, Darug. So in another way, your mother and father? My, oh, my father's ab Aboriginal, my mother's Irish, my great-grandmother's full blood, and my other grandfather's Irish. It's, it's special even coming in here. Yeah. It's like a good feel I was here, mm. yeah, since I've been here. Anto seeks Richard's help to find out why the mountain has been calling him. And they don't say I can't find them. And I can swear they were up there on the top. On one of his excursions, he'd seen something he thinks may hold the answer. This is a calendar. It lets people know from other areas how many people are living in the one region. So over time, it's obviously been knocked down and broken. Either by wild animals or by people. Why would they put them up so high, like right on top? So everyone can come to the elevation and understand how many people live in the area. Mm -hmm. See, so each rock represents a clan, yeah. 30, 40 people. Right. So there's about 700, 800 people that live in the vicinity of where we are. Would it be all right for me to put a stone on top of the Representing your family? Family. I'd be honoured. Thank you. Balanja. Gumeda. Gomel. To put the rock there is honour for me to be part of this land. And I hope they accept it. Go back this way. Two hundred years ago, the early colony saw bitter conflict over land, food and access to the river. Dozens of whites were killed. The Aboriginal death toll was probably several times greater, but no records were kept. Our little colony is about to feel the repercussions of this confrontation between civilizations. By decree of the British government, over 400,000 acres of land was granted to white settlers in the first three decades. Timber was a vital resource. The bark of the trees was used for roofing, and timber slabs were split from logs to make walls and fences. Coming onto a piece of land, that's fairly rough hewn around the edges and we can clear our land. Um, we can cut our logs up and split them and create something, create something out of nothing. That's exciting to me. It's going a lot better now. We've got a system going, me and Keo. She's going up fine now. John Stevenson is building a small log hut high on a rock overlooking his land. It's difficult yep. to construct, but at least it will be flood-free. 
It's not as easy as what you think, though, because the slabs are so warped. It's not just a matter of cutting the edges and dropping them in. One can just go in beautiful and take you 10 minutes. Then with the other, you can be with the uh, axe for 20 minutes pratting about. It's heavy, it's humping, but it's no problem for us strong men. We can do it. Having finished their floor, Morris Hurley and his son Declan start building the walls of their house. So basically there's the floor. I'm going to try to replicate that two metres higher. But uh, it's difficult because you can't nail this wood here. We're not, we're not take a nail. This goes in, and the nail bends. It's like steel. So you have to work around it. Yeah. As night falls, the settlers make their way to the Koori camp, where they've been invited to meet Richard Green. Excuse me, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the camp here. We've got a very special guest here, uh, Yellow Monday. He's here to tell us some stories about this land. Ujeri Nagati. Good evening. Wayana na pamol bure ya yaban. Wingeri wa wango. Yana madayu bayo. Biyal ya wari yananga. Through Mother Earth, we're singing through music. We've all got totem and clan. I'm not crazy by the moon. I actually speak my language. My great great grandmother's Maria Locke. My great great grandfather's John Randall. I'm of Irish Aboriginal extraction. So I don't drink too much because I punch myself up. But having said that, it's uh, where it's about reclaiming our language because we were stopped from speaking it, and it's been a hundred years since this language was spoken in this area. If everyone would like to just repeat with me a bit of language, um, Kabera means your head. Garaway, Garaway. White cockatoo. Aragon, Aragon. War shield. Baranga, Baranga. Our place. This place. How many different Aboriginal languages are there? Over 600, yes. Yes, all one law, though. The one law are the Ten Commandments. You don't touch a child, they're sacred. You don't ever, ever hurt an old person because they're just as sacred. And the rest of us in between, we look after them. Well, I'd just like to thank you very much for coming. It's been really, really special to me. Thank you. I can feel something inside, actually. You did a good. OK. I hope you enjoy your stay. Well, it's strange, really. I just felt a feeling inside. It's funny, this place is it's a strong Aboriginal place and there's a lot of things that happened in this valley. And I think the th the, some of the things that happened to the Aboriginals their spirits will still be about in this place, and I did feel something. It touched me, it touched me here, didn't it? Oh, we were all laughing at him this morning. Everyone, everyone in the camp going, John. <laughs> He's strange. Your teeth have never been as clean. For teeth cleaning, we just use them little, um, like little tiny leaves on this tree and you just rub them all over your teeth. Which, you know, it's not bad. Living in the Australian bush under 19th century conditions is proving to be very confronting for some of the women in the colony. For toilet roll, we use the big wreck on the trees. It's not that comfortable, but it does the job. It's not green leaves because they do nothing and it's soft enough and it does the job and at least we've got something. Oh yeah, jeez, that's brilliant. Do you know what? I haven't washed my face for about three days. Yeah. I really wasn't prepared for the dirt and that's what I'm finding hardest to cope with. I get so frustrated because 
the clothes are filthy and the dishes are filthy and you get up every morning and you feel like you just want to get a shower and you can't and it's just it's unbelievably depressing There may be no water on tap or hot showers, but the river is cool and clean. As a rule, colonial women didn't learn to swim like this, but they still needed to cross the river. There are several accounts of early settlers getting tangled in the weeds and drowning. On a ridge, High above the settlement, Anto takes Kevin Markilly, one of the Irish family's convicts, on a search for bush honey. Oh, here we go. These are your native bees. They won't sting. And that yellow bit there, that's the eggs. At first, Aboriginal people shared their bush knowledge with early settlers. During times when the colony teetered on the brink, their assistance sometimes made the difference for settlers between life and death. What's that? Red. Red, Red. 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 What do you got? Native beer. Yeah. Have a taste. They they like in a salad. I gave them all a taste. They were really keen to taste it, especially Kashai and Linky. They said it was nice, and I gave them a taste to practically all the coal in It's a bit bitter. Yeah. In the early 1800s, pigs were a common sight on the farms of Hawkesbury settlers. The Honky family are the first to complete their pig pen and therefore receive a pregnant sow which will shortly deliver a number of piglets. Look at the size of it, eh? Or, as Kerry sees it, tasty hams. She looks like she's very close to giving birth. Hopefully we'll get quite a few piglets and um, we can use them for trade and who knows, maybe put them on the dinner table at some stage. Have a hot bigger. Yeah, she's a bloody beauty. We're naming her Bodio now? I think so. Yeah. Bodie the pig. According to their customs, Luana and Lorna invite the settler women to spend time away from the men. I've shaved my legs and not a cut on them. I did under my hands, but I only got part way through them. Right, okay. Can't show you, because I'm all tucked in. Oh, what did you in. use? The cut oh, round. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How long have you got? You could make a good one. Half Some of the women bring their sewing along. They've decided to make flags, symbolising their different identities. What's your flag going to be, Lorna? Black stand for the heavenly people. The yellow stand for the sun. And the red stand for the blood spilt. So it represents the trouble that you've had. Yeah. It's your flag, Trace. Eureka Stockade. So it's a bit later on in the time that we were here. In the early colony, raising any flag other than the Union Jack could be taken as an act of treason. The colonial government was especially sensitive to any display of Irish nationalism like the flag the Hurleys are making, which was raised during the 1798 rebellion. It's not the modern Irish one. It's the one that would have been used back then, like 200 years ago. It's called the green flag. What, what it is it? Harp. Harp, you know, like the oh, musical yeah, yeah, instrument. Yeah, yeah. Has anybody got sharp as yeah. It was quite striking, really, for three women to be sitting talking about uh, their culture and their heritage around a flag. In your daily life, you don't think that too much about those kind of emblems. But when you come along to, some, to a place like this, all of a sudden your culture and your heritage becomes really important. While the women are busy sewing flags, the Stevenson's 18-year-old convict, Andrew Hamang, from Sydney, cooks for the kids. Yeah. Came for another one, Tom? Yep. I could eat another 
tin. Yep. Mm -hmm. Andrew really has an interest in cooking. Today he's made dinner and he's made pancakes using his special little mix and that, and it's worked out really good. Tyler, who ate the most junk food, now doesn't. There's no cook different meals as there is at home. You have to cook one meal and they all eat it and they're grateful for it too. At first, the kids in the colony got sick from the radical change in diet. After two weeks, they're all eating again, but finding the food monotonous. A bit sad. A bit sad. <laughs> I don't like eating boys all the time. Porridge. <laughs> I wouldn't like them fruit to eat. From fruit. <laughs> I was really concerned about Lincoln and probably Kashai. She's the fussy, fussy one. So I want some potatoes. Yeah. Did you not get any potatoes? Mm -hmm. They haven't been given any choices what they're used to having. Lincoln didn't think that he would never normally eat which is pretty good for his age, so he's obviously pretty hungry. And, um, yeah, I mean, they're eating a lot more than what they would at home. Jolly. What's up? Do you want something? There's plenty of dampers. Amber, Jalo and Luana share an evening meal as guests of the Honky family. We're close to the Honkies and it's all good. We stayed there last night, chilling out, around the fire with Kashaya. We just get on better with them. The goanna, the six-foot king reptile of the Australian bush, is plentiful in the valley. Anto hasn't tasted goanna for years. There's no blood like I've ever touched. Convict Steve Keogh is always keen to eat freshly killed meat. He's often to be found at the Koori camp. I don't run down the settler families, um, but I certainly feel that because of where I am and, and my own background that I need some space away with what I call real people, people that I can relate to. Ooh, I never had some of this for ages. You know that? Oh, look at that. You know that, Dad? It's just like butter. Yeah. Three of them. Yep. I'm ready to have it. After half an hour cooking in hot coals, the goanna is ready for eating. Two important bush tucker. For vitamins. And medicine. Uh, Theo? Absolutely. Mm. In the early colony, some convicts escaped their masters and fled into the bush. More than a few of them thought they could walk to China. Most soon gave themselves up hungry and terrified. But a few convicts, particularly the Irish, settled into Aboriginal clans and stayed out of the clutches of the authorities for decades. Some of these became notorious bushrangers. <laughs> what are you doing with that now? We've got to take the billy goat. Yeah, we're going to carry him. We're carrying them. No, we have them on a leash. No, no. Yeah. you'll be dragging them along the ground. <laughs> All they'll be doing is wee, wee, squealing for the mum. And then they flip upside down. We need to catch them. Brilliant, Liz. Another ten days have passed in the valley, and it's now time for their next instalment of government stores. One's called Cook Pop, and one's oh, called Billy Cam. Come on, then, Cook Pop. The Stevensons are taking their kid goats down to the river to trade. So you're hurting him? Yeah, well, no, we can't, can't do that. We're carrying him. <laughs> the families can now barter what little they have for luxuries like fruit and vegetables. They've had neither for 20 days. Getting the best deal is a high priority for John Stevenson. Well, we haven't even sorted this out. We need to sort what we're actually getting for the goats first, because they might not be going. 
we don't get what we want. Yeah, well, that's just it, you know. We can't give in to just anything. No, I'm bad. you're going to set a precedent here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever you get for this, that's going to sort of set a marker. You know, it's a bit like benchmarking. You ever heard of benchmarking? I've heard of benchmarking. No, it's a bit like that. Historian Michael McKernan returns with goods to trade, government stores, and Shelley Williams, a second female convict. Hello. Hello again. Let me introduce um, Shelley Williams to you. She's our, our new female convict, and she's going to the Stevenson family. This is the Stevensons. This is John. Nice to meet you, Shelley. <laughs> okay. This is Liz. Hi. This is Karina, my daughter. Hello. And this one here is Tyler, my son. Okay. And you will be with us for oh. as long as you can last. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got stores for you all. Um, these stores are lasting for nine days, and I'll be back in uh, ten days' time with more stores. And, um, nine I'm, or ten? Uh, well, the stores will last for nine days, so I'll come back on the ten. Yeah. yeah, that's a bit um, Irish now, as we'd say. Mm. Hey, very Irish. We'd say that's a bit Irish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fair enough. Stores for nine days, we'll be back in ten. ten. I believe you've got some goods you want to trade. Who, who wants to go first? Who, who wants to start trading? We've got two kid goats. Okay, they're great. They're great. They're a good breed, man. Are they, they good are top goats? breeding the goats, yeah. the best yeah. in okay. Australia. Well, what do you want for those? We want a cook pot a cook and pot. a billy can yeah, for great. one and some fruit and veg. Okay. For the other, but not just for one week, fruit and veg for more than one week. It could be argued that you haven't got a very good trade because yeah. all you've got are a couple of goats. Yeah. You know, yep. they look good to you, they look they look terrific and, and you're fond of them, obviously, but goats in the colony were not uncommon. Yeah. You know, the point is, have you got a good enough trade to justify what, you, what you're getting? If you don't like the trade, then walk away from it. Say, I'm sorry, look, I'm not going that path. We don't know what the trade is with the fruit okay, and veg. Well, OK, well, have a look. H here we are. You've got cabbage, that amount of carrots. In the early 1800s, there was no single currency in the colony, and prices fluctuated dramatically. When there were shortages, traders could command virtually any price they asked. Ah, yes, we will do the deal. We'll do the deal. And last week, the Hurleys are so desperate for fresh food, they're willing to trade the family china. Very good quality. Yeah, they are. The colonists take their trading much more seriously than Michael McKernan had bargained for. Thank you. Like these are not common in the colony because I know from the yep. dishes I've seen around, they're actually very yeah, yeah. I accept you know? that. So but, they but are that, of value. They are of value. Yeah. But yeah. It's what I can get for them back in Sydney. Now, everybody in Sydney's got plates, you'd understand that. And the food situation in the colony is precarious. Mm. Now, I'm not here out of the hardness of my heart doing these things. I'm telling you the reality. There are people starving in we're, Sydney. We're living the reality. OK. We know. We know I know. Reality. I'm sorry. Yeah. But you know, this is the best I can do. Trust me. <laughs> they were placed. <laughs> Are you hard ass trailer? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very handy basket. That's the yeah. second one. Did you make it? Yes. You made it. That's what you call rural gear, isn't it? Mm. I mean, that's that's the genuine stuff, and I, I I congratulate you for making it. I I think it's a its value is its rustic quality. I mean, mm. obviously people have got baskets in Sydney. Um, I'll give look. I, it's not worth much, mm -hmm. OK? But I have got some, um, some stuff over, so I've got here some, some apples again. They're as fresh, as fresh as could be, and some oranges. That's the best I can do. Why don't you take it? You but give us something extra next week. Because um, we've got the leftover crap after everyone else. <laughs> All man. right, I don't want the don't basket. Want the I'll basket. take the gear <laughs> back. It's a deal, is it? OK, good on you. OK. Good morning. John Maynard from the University of Newcastle is an Aboriginal historian. He's come to talk to Anto and the clan about the history of black-white relations in the Hawkesbury area. So how's things going with the white fellas down here? 
So what's been happening with them? What? Tried them with them, or...? Yeah, we get along real well. Um, the Aussie family, we get along really well with them. Oh, true, yeah. Yeah. Now I'm good. That's good. I was going to um, have a bit of a yarn to you about what was going on around here 200 years ago, and um, some of it wasn't too nice as well, you know. And I think that's pretty important that we recognise what happened and we can draw strength, you know, from the, the courage that our mob had around here. Yeah. You had basically, you know, constant conflict and what was described as open warfare <coughs> around here. And um, all around this area, least about 26 whites were killed by the Durrock mob. But that was in response to what was going on, you know. We were stopped from going to the river, our resources were run down, you know. So it was in direct response to that. We'll never know how many Aboriginal people died. Just settlers and vigilante groups, they just running around killing Aboriginal people wherever they could find them. Some of them stories at that time, there was, um, and that's in this area, one Aboriginal boy was caught by settlers and he was dragged back and forth across an open fire, severely burnt, and then thrown into a river, still alive, and the settlers took pot shots at him till they killed him. Another account was three Aboriginal boys were caught by settlers. One little boy got away, and the other two, they took the swords to him and killed them on the spot. I oh, know that history part really gets to me. Mm. Like, even today, right? Some of us, where we grew up and that, we can't even walk back on that land. And I don't think it's right. That history should not have ever been how it was. In 1805, during a year of hostility on the Hawkesbury, eight Aboriginal people and four European settlers were killed in a series of skirmishes. These events led Governor King to issue a proclamation. New South Wales, April 27, 1805. Whereas the natives in different parts of the outsettlements have in an unprovoked and inexcusable manner lately committed the most brutal murder on some defenceless settlers, it is hereby required and ordered that no natives be suffered to approach the grounds or dwellings of any settler until the murderers have been given up. The settlers are required to assist each other in repelling those visits. And if any settler harbours any native, he will be prosecuted. Signed, Philip Gidley King, Governor of New South Wales. Why? Huh? Okay. Well, put it in English. Basically, Governor King is saying that because there have been murders committed against white settlers, until the murderers are given up by the Aboriginal people, the Aboriginal people are not to be on the farms or the lands or in the houses or in any way having anything to do with the settlers. You guys are that far away, how do you know that we're carrying on as normal? Because we're all happy. But I'm telling you, this is the law, and one of the, one of the penalties of not observing the law may well be that your stores, you know, are at risk or, or reduced. We've heard a proclamation. That's right. And it's You've heard the proclamation. Yeah, yeah. I've Stop told us. you what the pro proclamation is. Yeah, it's up to you. Our 21st century settlers are concerned their rations might be cut if they disobey the proclamation. We should all just stick together and continue on what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And you suffer that consequence of your supply being cut. So your, your supply is uh, going to be cut over us. And this, this mm. touches on the subject yeah. yesterday, on how the ration thing come into it yesterday. There was uneven distributions of what we all got, you know, for, for plates, the quantity of fruit and veggie you get for basket. You know, it, it's just all, and like the two kid goats got less than what the plates did. They didn't actually. No, they, they got a lot more. They got twice as much. What the... begins as a discussion over how to react to the proclamation soon turns into a fight over trade. That you guys get extra things when you... Who? So you're moaning and groaning again now? Yeah, I am. What extra stuff, though? They're inside the argument. 
<laughs> they started getting into trading, <laughs> and I'm like, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> so I left. <laughs> and uh, with this whole law thing, I just reckon this is really a bunch of crap. With this is our land, they can't tell us to get off it. It's ours already. It was all right for them to come into our land and take our food away from us, but we wasn't allowed to take their food. But in other words, it's not our land. Well, That's what he said, it's not our land no more. Well, we know that. We was, we was always in the wrong. They was always in the right. Even though we might not have committed one crime, they commit a thousand or hundreds of ten times the crime. To me, it just made that piss off. Well, we getting, you know, close to everybody here. And, you know, like he said, that we don't have a bargain for anything and all that. I'm a convict, bust ass convict. It's got no. Like I don't us. even come into consideration. <laughs> I don't have any say in the discussion that's taking place, and I certainly don't wish to be part and parcel of um, what I call this frivolous barter that's going to be going on over there for the next hour or so. I'd just like us to cut off from the 20, 2004 and live in the 1800s. You can do that, and your family and you can do it. You, can. you don't want to be here. I for want that. to do it. I'm doing it. I'm telling you to just mind, you think your thoughts and leave me to the surface. You're trying to tell me everything that you think you know. You know jack shit about what I'm thinking. Don't come across in cameras as if we ask oh, nothing. excuse me, no. Morris, why don't you just pull your head in? Okay. No, you've got your opinion, I've got mine. Fair right? Enough. Don't tell me what I Fair think. Fair enough. Fair enough. The rest of the discussion sort of deteriorated into trivial stuff. And I think if we're going to get bogged down in trivial things like that, then we're not going to be able to address major issues like this proclamation. The problem is that we have to sort it out soon. This thing is, as of now, we're not allowed to um, have relations, neighbourly relations, with the Indigenous community here. I don't agree with that. So we're going to have to sort. We network with the Coories, the kids all just blend. You know, you look at them over there, all middling around. They're all playing, and I'm not, I'm not stopping that. I don't give a shit what the bloody history man says. Well, we decided to stick together, so if that's your decision, we'll stick mm. with you. And we've not decided that lightly, it's fully... And this is where I just wonder how deep people's commitments would be. Okay. If the decision is made, I would like that decision to be firm, that nobody yeah. in two weeks' time goes, oh, but we can't live off of nothing. I can't remember what year I we in. You can remember what year we were in. 1805, is it four? Four? 405, I think. You'll be my witness. Convict Keo. So we're going to jail together? You and I are. Without consulting the Hurleys, Kerry Honky places a sign inciting rebellion at the entrance to the valley. Hang on. This land is ruled by common law, obey or else. Family? Yep. Once you're inside this land, we're not going to be told and pushed around and shoved and told what to do by any government. Or any damn king, for that matter. Or any bloody <laughs> arsehole. <laughs> the Koori clan gather support and march onto the Honky's farm with their flag. Only my boy. That's the way. Kerry. Only my boy. Only comes together to protest Governor King's historical proclamation. You know we stand against unruly rules.
the government of the early colony was very concerned about any threats to public order. Acts of insurrection like this would have been punished. Jail terms for the free settlers and for convicts, flogging and banishment to the coal mines of Newcastle. What's happening now? There is a piece of paper called a proper, yeah, proclamation <laughs> on my land, which I don't agree with. We don't agree with it, so yeah. we're going to burn the damn good. thing. We're not going to touch it, we're going to burn it where it stands. Is it on your land or is it on colony land? It's on his land. He's allowed to burn it. Who cares? We're burning it. That's what land is We've read it. We should all be consulted before we burn it. But you can burn anything you want. If we're making a decision in the colony, we, we discuss it and then decide. Disagreement once again threatens to derail the potential for unity in the colony. That's what yesterday was talking when Liz was there and said that she agrees that we stand united I said, to, I said to Anton and Lauren yesterday afternoon, I said we totally stand with them, this thing is going nonsense. But it wasn't agreed by the group. We all want to get rid of it because none of us actually agrees with it. But in order to reach that conclusion, possibly there should have been a process or a discussion about it which didn't happen. Oh, I thought. We all said we we'll do without the rations. We decided I and the said aboriginals it, you said it. can go anywhere they want. We've all agreed that. Yeah. So this burn is a separate issue. So everyone who wants to burn the proclamation no, puts a stick well. down and then we'll just burn it. It's back, wouldn't it? No. <laughs> burn the Democracy eventually prevails and Morris Hurley leads the action they may lose their stores. Historically, they would have risked their lives. It is hereby required and ordered that no natives be suffered to approach the grounds or dwellings of any settler until the murderers are given up. The settlers are required to assist each other in repelling those visits. And if any settler harbours any native, he would be prosecuted. Signed, Philip Gidley King, Governor of New South Wales. And we got a light. Oh, good sir. I'll be sure. And that way we still free. Yeah. Yes, and you know we stand. We do. Yeah. Kids. I'm going with these little ones. Yeah. Why not? Anto and his small clan decide to leave the valley. They conduct a smoking ceremony to farewell the land and the spirits. They depart without telling the settlers. I made my mind up to move off their land, move to a better place where it's peace and quiet, um, so they can have their land without getting their stores taken off them. Their forebears moved from camp to camp following the seasonal food cycles. It's something the Europeans came to refer to as walkabout. The next morning, the Aboriginal clan don't show up at the Honkies place for porridge as invited. Do you have any idea where they might be? No? Do you want to go up to the park and find out if they're up there? The Australian boys have formed a close bond with the Aboriginal clan. They go up to the Koori camp to look for them. Was there anything at their camp? Any blankets? No. Huh? I, I can't see any. <coughs> Did you call out? No. They took off across the common. And um, Lauren had Amber with her. I don't know where Ante was. Ante wasn't with her. Oh. But um, somewhere he'd gone. The grid's gone. You've got to use your lift cards up to you. So they're not going to be down here. Come here. Come here. Suck the 
I don't know why they've gone on. I don't know if they've just gone on a walkabout or we've no we've no clue or idea. But I'll look forward to when they come because I quite miss them. This walkabout thing. I don't does anybody really understand it who isn't a Cory? I just hope they can come back anyway. I don't I don't really understand. But um I hope they do, because they're lovely people. Next week on The Colony, the drought finally breaks, but it doesn't dampen the conflict. Now we're in a really good mood this morning, and then more bullshit happening. Shut up, will you? Shut the f up, will you? My God. Hi. And Kerry and Morris pay for their seditious acts. It'll be very interesting, because I don't think either of them particularly like each other. Anyway out there? Not unless you can get very, very small. <laughs>